Thank you. It's good to be speaking to the overcomers. The Medicoy, <laughs> the, the uh, partners of Christ. Okay, I have a question to start out this session. You can see my title. My question is, give me, who can give me some, a synonym for just or justice? What would be a synonym for just or justice? Fair. Fair? Practical. What's that? Practical. Right? Practical? Impartial, right? Now, here's a question. How do we decide what's fair, what's right, what's just, what's impartial? How do we make that decision? And let me make it harder. How does the atheist decide what is fair, what is just, what is right, what is good, what is correct, impartial? How does the atheist decide that? What's that? Yeah, ultimately, the problem the atheist has is finding any source for absolute truth, right? Ultimately, in order to decide what is just, you have to have some way of saying there is something which we all agree is true. And whether you call that natural law or whether you call that God's law, in any case, you have to have some measure, right? Now, let me ask you this. There's a so-called liberal wing of the Supreme Court, right? And I say so-called because I don't, I don't think liberalism today is really uh, in keeping with the, the liberal ideals and the philosophies of liberalism. But in any regard, there's a so-called liberal wing. How do they determine what is just, right? What, what is their factor? They don't go to the Constitution and say, what did the Founding Fathers mean? Instead, I think they say, if the Founding Fathers were alive today, what would they rule, right? And so they see the Constitution as a living, breathing document. I remember hearing someone speak about uh, the origin of species in 1859 and how that influenced everything. It influenced the Supreme Court. It used to be the Supreme people who went into the law would study commentaries about the Constitution and about the law. But over time, the Constitution became, I mean, by 1870, I think they were beginning to talk about the Constitution as a living, breathing document. Well, if the Constitution, right, is not our guide, but instead what would the founders mean if they were alive today becomes really what do the justices think is right. So when gay marriage became a thing and gay marriage became a constitutional right, it's not because they found that in the Constitution, it's because it seemed right to them. And ultimately, Right and wrong today is more or less determined by what people think is right, which reminds me of the book of Judges, right? Remember the key phrase in Judges? What is it? Every man did what was right in his own eyes. So what was justice? Whatever that person thought was justice. And by the way, that's kind of the motto of post-modernity, isn't it? <laughs> Something can be right for me, but not right for you. And, and we're all cool with that, except when what's right for me contradicts what's right for you, right? Then, uh, then suddenly I'm homophobic. Then suddenly I'm this, that, or the other, you know? And they come up with names to uh, say, because you won't promote their view, therefore that means you are this, that, or the other. And I think the ultimate point we need to understand is if you want to know what's just, God. God is just. That's one of his attributes. Uh, he's eternal, for example. That's one of his attributes. He's good. That's one of his attributes. He's love. That's one of his attributes. But another of his attributes is he's just. Will not the judge of the earth do right? 
God is just. That's a bedrock principle. And if we lose that principle, we ultimately end up with everyone doing what's right in their own eyes. And then, of course, your Supreme Court becomes whatever is right in their eyes. And if you don't get what you want, well, maybe we can change the makeup of the court so that it will be like what we want. And ultimately, we move away from any kind of absolute truth. And, and that's a problem. Uh, haven't we all heard people who say, well, you know, it's not fair that I'm 30 years old and I have stage 4 cancer. God is not fair in that. I mean, if God were fair, I wouldn't be getting cancer. Um, we might say, you know, I grew up with abusive parents. That wasn't fair. Everybody didn't have abusive parents. God isn't fair that he allowed me to have abusive parents. And a lot of people get angry with God because of circumstances in their lives, right? And what they've done essentially is lost their minds. Because the bedrock principle is that God is just in everything. And even if we can't understand why some trial is happening in our lives, we're to count it all joy. Because God uses those trials to produce endurance and perseverance in us. And so, ultimately, we realize we're part of a bigger purpose, a bigger plan, and that this life is not all there is. In fact, this life is just the beginning. There's eternity that lies just ahead. And if we're believers in Jesus Christ, we'll be part of a kingdom that will be characterized by justice, righteousness, and peace. But right now, we don't live in a world that is just or righteous or peaceful. Now, hopefully, we have an influence such that it's more righteous and more just than it would be without the church, without our influence, but we're not ushering in the kingdom. You know, some people say the kingdom is already not yet. We had Stan Toussaint at our conference a few years ago back at the Riley Center, and he said, the kingdom is not now, and the kingdom is not now. <laughs> There's no already about it. <laughs> it is not already here. It's not yet. And we are looking forward to the kingdom. We're saying, come quickly, Lord Jesus. But we're not ushering in the kingdom. Uh, A.W. Tozier, who is not exactly a free grace advocate, made a good point, though, about our what we think about God. He said, ultimately, one of the most important things about us is our view of God, right? If we have a view of God as loving and kind and gracious and, yes, just, then that influences everything we think, everything we say, everything we do. But if we have an improper view of God, that negatively impacts what we say, think, and do. And I would argue that the justice of God is a bedrock principle. And we all need to be on board with this idea that God is just in everything he's ever done, everything he is doing, everything he will do. Every time he has judged some nation, some people, that's been just. Every time he is judging today, it's just. Every time he will judge in the future, it's just. Whether he's judging them in this life or at the judgment of the sheep and the goats or the judgment seat of Christ or the great white throne judgment, all of his judgments are just. But even believers can question God's justice. We can question it for a variety of reasons. Don't we all know people who would say, well, in my opinion, the death penalty is not just. So there should be no death penalty. Well, some of these same people say the God of the Old Testament is different than the God of the New Testament, right? Because the God of the Old Testament has the death penalty. And so they come up with some kind of 
crazy position that somehow God changed from, from uh, Old Testament to the New Testament. But the truth is that the death penalty was just, and therefore the death penalty is just. Uh, and the death penalty will be just in the millennium too, according to the Sermon on the Mount. Some people might think, well, you know, I, I've been poor my whole life. That's not fair. Well, uh, of course it is. Uh, whether, even if we have, it's not of any fault of our own, whatever circumstances we're in, we're to glorify God through those circumstances. And God can use those circumstances to his glory. And we can be poor in this world and rich in the life to come. The, the tragedy would be to be rich in this world and a pauper in the life to come, right? In, in 1 Timothy 6, Paul tells Timothy to instruct the rich to lay hold on eternal life that they might be truly rich in the life to come. Many people, this is weird, but true. Many people twist the scriptures to fit their view of justice. Now, of course, a lot of people do this in terms of their experience, right? I've had this experience, therefore, it must be true in the Bible. Some people do that with their testimony. Well, this is the way I came to faith in Christ, so this must be the way we should evangelize people. And even if it's not faith alone and Christ alone, they're like, but yeah, but that's not how I came to Christ. Well, my suggestion is change your testimony. Because <laughs> your testimony's wrong if it isn't the message of John 3.16 or Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, or John 5, 24. If your testimony isn't a faith alone message, <clears throat> then you can talk about how you took time to get there, but at some point you grasp the free gift of everlasting life. And the same is true with God's justice. Some people think that eternal conscious torment, ECT, is unfair. Therefore, you know what they do? They go to the Bible and they twist the texts that clearly teach this, and they teach conditional immortality, that God will annihilate all those who don't believe. Or they teach unconscious eternal torment. What is that, by the way? An eternal coma or something? I don't know. But essentially, it's a form of annihilationism, right? Other people teach universalism. Well, God's going to give people opportunities to come to faith after they die, and we'll keep thinning out Hades, and then I guess eventually the lake of fire will thin out to where eventually there's nobody there. Or God just graciously applies the blood of Christ to everybody, which of course he does, but instead of that making them savable, that saves them. So they don't need to do anything. They don't need to believe. Or there's lots of other systems. But that is twisting the scriptures to fit what you think should be fair. The same thing with degrees of rewards. I remember hearing uh, a famous theologian, a seminary professor, author of many books. He was speaking at the Evangelical Theological Society, and he gave a paper on degrees of reward in the kingdom, question mark. And he said there can't be degrees of rewards in the kingdom because that would be unjust. That would be unfair of God. Now, he did have a footnote. And he said, for those of you who are dispensationalists, I have no problem with a thousand years of rewards. Because in the scope of eternity, a thousand years is going to be as a, a second. It's going to be a blip in, in the radar of eternity. And so essentially, believers will have the same experience forever except for that first millennia. But he said, of course, I'm not a dispensationalist, so I don't believe in the millennium. <laughs> there won't even be degrees of reward then because there is no millennium, right? But why did he come to this position? Because he doesn't think it's fair that there should be some who rule with Christ and some don't. Of course, didn't Jesus say something about many of those who are first will be last, and many who are last will be... What's that about? Does that have any kind of literal sense that there's going to be some reversals? Some people who are first in this age who are going to be last in the kingdom, and some who are last now who are going to be first in the kingdom? Some of the people in our churches who, you know, are not well-known or whatever may be the great rulers in the life to come, and some of the people who are pastoring mega churches and famous 
uh, evangelists and stuff, if they're born again, <laughs> will be, some of them will, might be last in the kingdom. Some of them might not even be born again, of course, if they're a work salvation person that's never believed the free gift. And also, this third point, giving everlasting life on the basis of intellectual assent, that's easy believism. That's cheap grace. You ever heard that? Easy believism, cheap grace. That's promoting sin. You ever heard that one? And so what they're ultimately saying is that can't be true because that would be unjust. So what do they do? Well, they say, you know, John 3.16 is a tough verse. I don't preach John 3.16 because it's too difficult. Because it sounds like if you just believe in Jesus, you'll never perish but have everlasting life. So what I preach is James 2, 14 to 26, or <laughs> Hebrews 6, or Hebrews 10, or Philippians 2, 12, or all the warning passages in Scripture, right? And then if they do circle back to John 3, 16, guess what a believer is? A believer isn't one who believes. A believer is one who turns from his sins. A believer is one who commits his life to Christ. A, a believer is one who submits to Christ. A believer is one who obeys Christ. And ultimately, true faith is guaranteed to persevere until the end of your life. So if you don't persevere to the end of your life, you don't get final salvation, which, by the way, the scriptures teach salvation is final the moment you believe. Right? <laughs> there is no future final salvation it's final the moment you believe but why why do they come to these positions not because they give a fair reading of scripture and come to this conclusion but because these things do not match their concept of justice are you with me on this and weren't most of us this way at least on the third point at some point in our lives now i realize some of you may have grown up in christian homes and may have heard the faith alone position, and never remember a time when you didn't believe it. But for many of us, if not most of us, we were schooled in work salvation, right? I was in an extreme holiness group, sinless perfection group, one sin after you were saved and you'd lose your salvation and couldn't get it back. And that seemed just to me. And when I heard this, it seemed unjust to me, right? How many of us, you were kind of in some work salvation or lordship salvation background before you came to faith? Okay, that's a significant number of us. And to me, that's fertile ground for coming to faith if we're open. If we're willing to let the Spirit of God interact with us and enlighten us. And for me, it, was, it involved a friend coming to me uh, before my senior year in college, a guy from the cult, and he said, Bob, is it possible your view of the gospel is wrong? And I was like, I didn't tell him this, but I was thinking that would be the ultimate bummer. <laughs> I mean, I gave up sports, dating, everything else, just so I could be a part of this cult for the rest of my life which I didn't think it was a cult. I thought it was the way, the truth, and the life. <laughs> you know, it, it was uh, the Lord for me. Uh, whatever it said was right. And then I thought, what if he's right? So I prayed about it and went to a Campus Crusade for Christ meeting at his college and heard this message, and it seemed too good to be true. And I remember afterwards, some guy said a cuss word, and I said, that guy can't be saved. Say people don't cuss. And he said, well, maybe there's a difference between what it takes to become a Christian and grow as a Christian. I was like, what do you mean grow as a Christian? You start perfect and you stay perfect. <laughs> <laughs> but he did give me the number of Campus Crusade at my school, and I contacted them. And after five sessions where the guy kept quoting Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 about ten times every, every session, I finally got it. I was like... God opened my eyes, I saw it, I believed it. Many twist the scriptures in terms of, don't we all know people who are homosexuals and they're very nice people? I know a lot of homosexuals who are wonderful people, very nice people. And some of them are married to other people of the same sex. 
And they're monogamous. You know, they're, they're just those two people. They're not out having relations with other people. Now, that's not common, by the way, <laughs> within the homosexual community, just like it's not that common in the heterosexual community either. But the truth is, we do know people like this. And does it make sense that God would say that's wrong? Well, yeah, God is God. And if God made us a certain way, then to go a different way is contrary to God. In fact, I've seen a number of articles that say that in the creation mandate, God made them male and female. He didn't give us 150 genders or whatever the current number is. And he didn't give us plural pronouns to describe ourselves. You know, you can call me they, or you can call me we, or something. I, I don't get it. But uh, he created the male and female for the purpose of filling the planet, procreation. But this idea of monogamous, faithful, loving, homosexual relationships is not leading to procreation. Not unless they're finding somebody outside of their relationship to get what they need to have offspring. It would, a lot of people think it would be unjust for God to condemn those who've never heard, right? And so they come up with various ways uh, of dealing with that. Um, some say, as long as they're faithful in their own religion, if they've never heard, then they're going to get into the kingdom because they were faithful with the revelation they had. Which, by the way, should put a kibosh on missions. <laughs> because if we have tribal groups that have never heard about Jesus, once you tell them, now they become accountable. So if you don't tell them, they just need to be good tribalists. Um, but, again, that comes down to God's justice. And, of course, the view that many of us hold to is that God is drawing all. The heavens declare the glory of the Lord. Romans 1. What's known about God is evident in the creation itself. Even general revelation is drawing people to Christ. And John 16, 9 to 11, the Holy Spirit is convicting in the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. That's why you can go to people who've never heard a word of the Bible and they believe they're sinners. They believe there's a God and he's righteous. And they do believe in something of a coming judgment. And so those things are things the Holy Spirit is working in the lives of the unregenerate. Even people who've never heard about Jesus. And remember the Macedonian vision in Acts 16? Paul sees this vision and a, a man from Macedonia, which would have been my peeps, including modern-day Serbia, uh, they were saying, come over and preach to us. And there are lots of illustration and missions where people prayed and they were received a vision that some white person was going to come and tell them what they needed to do. And, and then missionaries came and they came to faith. We should uh, recognize that what is just is what God says is just, right? What is just is not what we say is just. If that's the case, then he's not God. We are, right? We become God, and we determine what's just, and then we're all little gods, and we all can have our own view of justice, and when your view of justice conflicts with my view of justice, well, I don't know what happens then. But whatever God does or has done or will do is just. And that's always the case. That's who God is. At God, GodQuestions.org, they have an article entitled, What Does It Mean That God Is Just? And they say this, When we say God is just, we mean he is perfectly righteous in his treatment of his creatures. I like that. He's perfectly righteous in the uh, treatment of his creatures. They go on to say God is just in meeting out rewards. And it says he's equally just in meeting out punishments. And they end by saying justice and righteousness, which always work hand in hand, are the foundation of God's throne. And they cite Psalm 89, 14. 
biblical declarations on God's justice. God is a just judge, Psalm 7, 11. A just, a, a just God and Savior, Isaiah 45, 21. A God of justice, Isaiah 30, 18. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Genesis 18, 25. This little comical discussion between the Lord Jesus pre-incarnate and uh, Abraham about, will you spare the people in Sodom if there's 50, 40, 30, 20, <laughs> 10 righteous people in Sodom? It's like, okay, no, there weren't 10. <laughs> and and so he, God would do right. God will never do wickedly, nor will he pervert justice. Job 34, 12. With justice and righteousness forevermore. This is the hallelujah chorus, you know, and Isaiah 9, verse 7. The Messiah is bringing in a just, righteous kingdom. You see, if we don't have the right view of God, then we're going to have a wrong view of the coming kingdom, unless we can twist it somehow to fit our view of what is just. You see, reality is what God says is true. And if we disagree with the word of God, then we disagree with reality. And we need to get our thinking in line with his thinking. We need to have what some of the speakers here have mentioned is a spiritual mindset. Or Paul calls it a spiritual mind. Uh, I guess it's uh, Romans 8, 6. It's life and peace. Uh, or the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2, 16. Now, evidence outside of Scripture that God is just. I would suggest that First of all, as I mentioned before, we see his attributes in the creation. We can at least know that he's the creator. We can at least know that he's all-powerful. And it seems to me we can know that he's beautiful because he's given us a beautiful creation and that he loves beauty because of the beauty he's put in creation. And we can also know, it seems to me, from the creation itself that God is just. Now, some of that you might say, well, it's hard. Paul does say in Romans 1 that his invisible attributes are seen in the creation. I don't know how far that extends, but it seems to me that just from the creation, we ought to be able to infer a lot of these things. But secondly, our laws come from God. Most of the laws of not just the United States, but most of the countries of the world come from uh, the laws of God. And, of course, we were created in God's image. He's the first cause of everything. He's personal, therefore we're personal. He's creative, therefore we're creative, right? And we, because we're in his image, have the opportunity to live justly and righteously and peacefully. Uh, and so all of these things, I think, are evidences <clears throat> outside of Scripture. Now, why... Is this so important for the victorious Christian life? The overcoming Christian life? Well, if we believe that he's just, then we have a favorable view of him. But if we don't, then we have some level of hostility toward God. And if we're carrying a level of hostility toward God, that is not conducive to uh, a good walk with God, right? To walk by faith means we walk by faith. And it's not just faith that I believe in Jesus and I have everlasting life. It's faith that what God says in his word is true. And one of those bedrock principles is God is just. As I mentioned before, Tozier basically says having the right view of God is fundamental to all of life. And although I think he was coming from a lordship uh, salvation perspective, I think he's absolutely right in that regard. We should love God. In fact, I'm convinced that the key to sanctification, to growth in the Christian life, is to following more and more and more in love with God. The more we love God, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments, right? 
We often think, keep my commandments so you can love me. I think it's the other way around. Our love for him produces the keeping of his commandments. And of course, that comes, Romans 12, 2, from our minds being renewed. Or 2 Corinthians 3, 18. God working in us to transform us from the mirror, the word of God. And he takes, the Spirit of God takes the teaching in the Word of God and he transforms us. But that's certainly, this is not some advanced level of theology that you have to have a doctorate to understand. In fact, I often say we're dying by degrees. The more theological education you have, the less likely it is you're going to be orthodox. <laughs> Probably true, I don't know. But, uh, I think it's important that we recognize that regardless of our level of formal theological education, we're all called to have renewed minds, right? We're all called to be in a church that's teaching the Word of God and that's challenging our thinking and helping renew our minds so that our lives are transformed. Uh, also, think of unjust parents. If you grew up with parents that were unjust, there was one rule today, and that was good today, and the next day you get whacked for doing the same thing that you were told to do the previous day, that creates a kind of a, a problem in your psyche. <laughs> it kind of gets fractured a little bit. And it's awful hard, if you have unjust parents, to love them. Now, you can forgive them, which is a good thing, and I think if you've grown up in a dysfunctional family, you do need to forgive your parents. And of course, we all need to forgive our parents because none of our parents are perfect. And if you're a parent, you're not perfect. None of us are perfect. But even if you experienced a lot of mistreatment, you didn't grow up with Ozzy and Harriet, you grew up with Ozzy and Sharon Osbourne, you know, or something. I don't know. Even if you got a lot of dysfunctionality, uh, the truth is, uh, you can still love your parents, but it's harder, a lot harder. And you need really the love of God to produce that love for your parents. So and when it comes to loving God, it seems to me it's foundational that we see him for who he is. He is beautiful. In fact, I remember hearing one ETS speaker talk about why all this redundancy? Why do we have billions of planets? We only need one. <laughs> Why billions? And he said, most theologians say it's because God loves beauty. Well, I think that is part of it. I think the other part of it is because he said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And then in the NIV it says, and then I want you to go to Mars and I want you to go to Alpha Centauri or whatever. Start, start populating those other planets and I'll teach you about wormholes later or something. Oh, I don't know if those exist, <laughs> but anyway. And the same thing with an unjust boss. If you work for an unjust boss, what do most of us do if your boss is unjust? We quit. We find another job. Now, if you can't right away, you may work for them, but you adjust what you're doing in light of their injustice, right? Their injustice. And we realize we're probably not going to get the raises we should get because they're not just. And we're, we're not going to get the promotions we could get because they're unjust. So it doesn't produce a great work environment. Um, same thing with an unjust judge. If you're going before an unjust judge, that is not good for you, and it does not lead you to have great expectations for the judgment. But we have a just judge. At the judgment seat of Christ, we're going to receive the fairest judgment in all of history. And in fact, we're going to get lots of mercy at it. The more we're merciful to others, the more mercy we're going to get. But it still will be a judgment. And it's still something that we should be concerned about. And we should be living in light of. Because we want to hear him say, well done. We don't want to hear him say, you wicked and lazy servant. So what about God's justice and eternal salvation? I think a lot of people have this just backwards. I mean, their idea is that it wouldn't really be right for God to give bad people everlasting life. 
So you've got to be good people in order to get everlasting life. Or at least you've got to become good people so that by the time you die, you're a good person and you've persevered in good things. I remember a discussion I had after a conference in Phoenix and I was at the airport with a pastor friend and we were talking about some of these issues and we were talking about eternal security and these two women joined in. And the one woman said, I just divorced, she was about 30, I just divorced my husband, he's a dog, he was cheating on me, and so and I, I divorced him. And you know what? He's, a, he's an idiot. He was saying, yeah, but I'm eternally secure. I believed in Jesus, and I know I'm still saved. And she said, he's going to hell, I can tell you for sure. <laughs> and then this other woman, this 65 or so year old woman, she comes up and she goes, yeah, God doesn't let bad people go to heaven. So then the pastor friend pointed, we pointed out to both of them, yeah, but we're all bad. And then the 65-year-old woman, yeah, but not really bad people, <laughs> only kind of bad people. And we ultimately pointed them to John 3.16. Either that's true or that's a fault. That's false. If it's true, then even somebody that commits adultery retains eternal life. Now, there are going to be consequences, and we talked about that. Yeah, there are consequences. One of them is he just got divorced, right? And there are other consequences. Um, some people think this, that if you promise it, uh, God would be unjust. This is the point here to promise everlasting life to the person who simply believes in him and then not deliver on his promise. Romans 3.26, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So God would be unjust if John 3.16 were not true. If Romans 3.21-31 wasn't true. If Romans 4.4 4 and 5 wasn't true. Ephesians 2.8 and 9 wasn't true. God has to deliver on his promises because that's who he is. He's not only true, and we should always praise him for the fact that he is true, right? I am the way, the truth, and the life, right? So he's not only true, he's also just in, in all that he does. We should praise God for his justice. I heard a message by Bob Bryant here at our conference so oh, seven, eight years ago in which he talked about praying the Lord's Prayer every day. And he said, instead of making it a rote prayer, when I come to hallowed be thy name, I praise him for either something about his character or something he's done in history or something he's done in my life. And I praise him for that. I praise him that he's true, that his word is true. I praise him that he's just, right? And it seems to me when you're singing praise psalms or praise songs, you should be literally engaging your mind on what you're praising God for. You know, to say hallelujah and think that's praising God is like saying praise JB, praise JB, praise JB. No, if I command you to praise JB, you'd say something nice about JB, right? We wouldn't all going around creating some expression, praise JB in Hebrew, you know. Hallelujah, baby. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I think I'm going to leave now. All right. And anything that happens in our life, we can say, look, God, I don't understand why I got cancer. I don't understand why I'm poor. I don't understand why this has happened. But you are just. And I know you are just. And I know all of this is going to be something that ultimately God will use in my life to produce more character, more godliness, more endurance, more perseverance in my life more glory to God, and ultimately it's going to result in me reaping more rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. So God is just, and this is a bedrock principle. Now, responding to objections, some people say, well, hell and eternal conscious torment doesn't make sense. Well, that's because people don't understand that God has created people to live forever and the only way to have everlasting life is by faith in Jesus, and God is drawing everyone to this. And we already talked about the heartfelt monogamous gaze. Yes, I understand, and these people may well have everlasting life. 
But if they want to live a life that's pleasing to God, then they need to be either celibate or marry someone of the opposite sex. And those who've never heard, God's drawing them. We talked about this before. So, also, what about degrees of eternal rewards? Well, that's what Scripture teaches. And by the way, that's consistent with everything in our life, isn't it? School, the military, your work, sports. Well, not sports anymore, but it used to be sports. <laughs> now everybody gets the trophy, you know. Uh, and giving eternal security to those who only have intellectual assent, sure, that makes sense, because we don't buy everlasting life. Jesus bought the kingdom, and he gives it to ever, anyone who believes in him. So in conclusion, we want our justices to be just. We want God himself to be just. Good news is he is. He's just in all he has done, is doing, and will do. Every future eschatological judgment will be just. It should almost be like a mantra for us. God is just. God is just. That should be part of our experience as we're saying, hallowed be thy name. At least a few times a year, we would be thinking, God, you are just. Or God, you were just when you dispossessed and destroyed the Canaanites. God, you were just when you destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. God, you will be just when Armageddon occurs and you destroy the enemies of Israel. God always has been, always will be. He's the embodiment of justice. Jesus is bringing this to earth. And God is just.